Okay, let's get started. Two announcements. Um, the first is about the midterm, where we have the midterm this Wednesday. All the rules I have posted on Slack and uh, UB Nurse. Um, then about homework one, uh, I explained uh, at the beginning of the class, uh, the homeworks are individual projects, individual homeworks. So we take uh, AI issues seriously. So we did find uh, some students have some misbehaviors in homework one. So we will contact those students and confirm with each of you. Uh, so since this is the first homework, if you get contacted and also we confirm those misbehavior, you will get zero points for that particular question. Uh, but uh, all of that, I will report to Office of uh, Academic Integrity. Well, I mean, per university policy, no matter how serious a violation is, we will apply to Office of uh, Academic Integrity. Um, so even if it is just a, a very mild violation, we will report. But uh, so for homework two, uh, I extend the deadline to Friday. So hope give you more time to prepare for your midterm. And also it means for homework homework two, uh, we will check uh, AI issues seriously. Um, so homework homework two, I believe it's a, a lot of coding compared to homework one, but I give you more days. So I hope uh, you do not uh, violate AI policies. Okay. Today we will talk about uh, database security. Uh, so far, we have talked about several different access control models, uh, mandatory access control, discretionary access control, uh, role-based access control, and uh, attribute access control. So those are the research efforts uh, for the last several decades. And those access control models have been adopted in our real, real, real life and also adopted in many different systems, including uh, database systems. So a lot of our database systems use uh, uh, RBAC and also the compilation of other access control models. And uh, also uh, they have some uh, their unique uh, challenges. For example, uh, many of you heard about SecU injection. Uh, that's uh, one of the unique challenges of um, database database management systems, and also that challenge is related to software security because SecU is kind of like a software; it's a command, a software, and the SecU injection is kind of like inject your own code into uh, to execute some code you are not supposed to execute. So it's we will talk about those issues in software security class. Uh, those are unique to database. So today, we will first uh, have a, a little bit overview of our, our relational database, uh, which is still the most uh, popular database we use. Uh, now we have um, many different other database. We have graph database, for example. A lot of our systems are building on top of a graph database. But a relational database is still the most popular one. So we will talk about that. Um, we talk about database security issues, the threats they are facing, and also different access control uh, mechanisms. Also, um, even with those access control mechanisms, um, we still can perform all kinds of attacks, uh, like uh, inference attacks in existing database. Uh, that's why uh, a lot of uh, a privacy preserving a anonymity database has been proposed in the last two decades. Uh, we will briefly touch those topics as well. So a database is basically a structured collection of uh, data. Uh, relational database uh, is the most popular one. Uh, uh, a database management systems or DBMS uh, allows us to construct, manipulate, and maintain the database. Um, there are many 
those systems available. Some of them are open source, some of them are not. Uh, if you have been coding like a website or other systems, you have you probably use your use the some database applications like uh, MySQL, uh, Oracle database, those kind of things. Uh, and uh, I guess most of you already know that uh, database, especially for, for relational database, we have a query language. Uh, this is a, like a standard, which is a SQL language. Uh, this language can specify how we query, how we update, even how we create the database. And in relational database, uh, all data are stored in tables. And the table basically describe uh, relations. Uh, each record, which is a row, each row is a record. Uh, then each column uh, represent an attribute. So here we have a very simple table. Uh, this table have uh, four columns. Uh, user, uh, employee ID, name of the employee, uh, salary of the employee, and the department of ID of that employee. So this table only has four columns and also four records. So each record represents a different employee. Uh, and uh, in relational database, we have a concept of primary key. So a primary key uniquely identify each row in a table. So in this example table, obviously, uh, the primary key here should be employee ID. Uh, even though department ID here, oh no, in this example, department ID doesn't identify um, each row, actually, because we can say Alice and David, they're both from department three. Um, so, but if the table is uh, small enough, it's possible that there are multiple keys that can identify one user. But, but uh, the intention here is to use the employee ID, which is the unique ID for each employee, to be the primary key in this table. So we can also create a relationship between tables by linking their attributes together. Uh, this is done by foreign keys. So primary keys, foreign keys, uh, they are the database, uh, the relational database concepts. So a foreign key is one or more attribute that appears as the primary key in another table. So in this example, we have two tables. The first one is the same as I, the one I just showed you. Uh, employee name, salary, department ID, uh, we can call this table employee. Then another table, which is a right-hand side one, is a department table, which we have a department ID, name of the department, and the phone number of the uh, department. As you can see, in the second table, the primary key should be the department ID here. And uh, the department ID, which is a primary key, primary key of the second table is also a column in the first table. So for the first table, the department ID is a foreign key because it's a primary key of the second table. Okay. So um, database always also supports something called a view, which is a virtual table. It's not really a table. Um, it's not a table stored in the database uh, directly. So a view is a virtual table that displays selected attribute from uh, one or more tables. Uh, let's say from the first table, you do a SQL query, you, you um, create a view with employee ID name and the department ID. You do not care about the salary there. Then you create a new virtual table. So which is uh, this one, right? So it's a subset of the first table that is called a view. Uh, also from the second table, the so second virtual table there, you can see it has employee ID, 
username and uh, the department name of that employee. So, but if you go back to our database, um, those information, those three columns, they're actually from two different tables. So that's, so in this example, a view is created from uh, two different tables. So we use uh, uh, the structured query language, the SQL language, to query uh, relational database. For other database, graph database, uh, they may have their own language, different syntax, different uh, semantics. Uh, I list uh, several examples here. Uh, to create a table, you just use the SQL keyword, create table. Uh, I don't, I don't think they have to be uppercase, but we use uppercase here to show they are keywords here. Then you have the table. This is before you have tables in your database. You try to create some tables. Then you do create a table, the table name, employee in this case. Then you need to specify what are the columns in this new table. Uh, the columns are employee ID. Then you tell the database management system this is an uh, integer. Um, obviously, you could also specify how big this integer is, uh, eight bytes, four bytes. Then you also tell the database management system uh, this integer is a primary key. Then there's a name, which is 30 bytes of uh, characters. Uh, salary, which is an integer, and also department ID, also integer. If you want to retrieve information from a database, uh, the, you use the select keyword. So I believe most of you use some things before. Okay. So select in SQ uh, is kind of like read, right? It means read. So you select employee ID, you select name from the table employee, then you add uh, a condition here. We want someone whose salary is greater than 70. So in this case, you can say, when you read from a table, you do not necessarily read everything from the table. Here, we are only reading from, actually, uh, we're only printing two columns from the table, which is employee ID and name. We don't care about the department ID. We do not print out a salary. But um, we're only printing those two. But, uh, but uh, under the hood, we're actually reading the salary because we're comparing the salary, but we're print not printing out. So you can imagine all of this are related to access control. Whether the user who is typing those commands, who is issuing those command queries, do they have the permission to read those columns, right? Those are security issues. For uh, creating views, uh, the command is like uh, create view, uh, then give uh, the view a new name, like employee two. Then for this view, uh, we have um, three columns, uh, EID, name, department ID. And uh, how do we create this view? Uh, we are actually selecting reading from other tables, or from reading the employee table and also from the department table. And uh, uh, where you know, we have blah, blah here to say what are the conditions. Uh, this, those basically are the conditions. So create those views. Um, it is used as a security mechanism. So some users, they do not have the privilege to directly issue queries to the database, uh, but they can uh, access some specific views. Uh, the views could be created by the administrator. Uh, by doing this, we, we give them a limited access, more fine grade access to the data, the data in the database. Uh, database, obviously, there will be many users of database. Uh, there will be administrators. There will be uh, people uh, keep sending queries to the database. Uh, that's why uh, there is a concept of user in all the database management systems, and also we need to authenticate them. So most of you, maybe you use the PHP to write a, data, uh, write a website before, so at your 
database module, you, you put a username there and you also put a password there. Then there is a PHP API for you to collect to the database and um, using the username and password. So there is an authentication there. Um, also, um, the database itself, it do not necessarily execute or run on the same computer as the software which querying the database. So the secure communication between the program and the database, they may distribute it, uh, is also uh, a topic, also need to be secured. Uh, database itself, there are many different uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, sanitization is one way to to prevent secure injection. Uh, there could be also malicious code in other malicious code in uh, secure uh, languages, the queries. Uh, and also, we always want to limit who can collect to the database. The database may have its resides on its own virtual machine or physical machine there. Uh, we, we do uh, connect uh, all kinds of uh, authentication, also firewalls there, which we will talk about in the network security class. Uh, secure injection uh, attacks is one of the most uh, prevalent and also dangerous type of uh, attacks uh, to database. Uh, this is a topic we will mainly discuss later in the software security class. Uh, because database itself, the management system is uh, a software. Uh, the secure language is a language itself, so they have similar issues as other like binary or um, JavaScript languages. So uh, secure injection has been discovered for, I don't know, two, three decades, and uh, we still have a lot of uh, uh, attacks, real-world attacks using secure injection. Uh, the basic idea is the attacker will uh, enter some uh, maliciously craft the input, and that input eventually, usually those inputs are to a web uh, dialog, a web uh, form, and uh, those inputs uh, eventually could uh, send to the database management system as a secure language. Um, by by doing secure injection, uh, all kinds of things can happen. Uh, the there could be information leakage. Uh, attackers may extract some records they are not supposed to have access to. Uh, they can also update uh, the database, uh, change the database, or even. Uh, wipe the whole database out. So we will talk about it later. Access control models, uh, most database management systems, they provide either discretionary access control model or role-based access control model. Uh, this depends on uh, what kind of uh, access control model uh, the, 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 the organization wants. Um, some key, component, key components in database access control, uh, the privileges, uh, the views, uh, stored procedures, uh, roles, and the row level access control. So we will go through each of them uh, next. So uh, database level, uh, what kind of uh, privileges we have what, or what kind of access rights we have. Uh, in the file system, we talk about the rights we have usually include the read, write, execute, right? Especially for the default Linux file system. Those are the three basic permissions or access rights. For the Linux uh, process, then one process can control send messages to a different process. Then there will be many different other uh, access rights. Uh, a process can kill another process, process, a process can wait for another process, can read the content of another process. There are many different privileges. Uh, when it comes to database, basically we have uh, 
uh, this um, access rights. Uh, create, including create tables, uh, create new rows, basically create a new data, uh, select, which is read, uh, insert, means adding data, adding a row to the database, uh, update a row in the database, delete, and also uh, add references. Basically, we divide those privileges into two bigger categories. One is called the system privilege. Obviously, they are rights to perform a particular action on any schema object of a particular type. So those are bigger um, privileges, bigger rights, like uh, to uh, select any table or order the whole table. Then there are object privileges. Uh, they perform a particular action on a specific uh, object, uh, such as tables, views, procedures, and types. Um, some select, uh, insert, update, delete. So those permissions has um, more fine grained a fine a granularity there on updating the objects in the database. Uh, also related to uh, how to grant and revoke privileges, uh, the secure language itself also uh, has interfaces to do this. Uh, the grant privilege command or secure language itself has this syntax, uh, grant what privileges or roles uh, on which table to which user or row or everyone. Uh, identified by some uh, password uh, with more grant uh, options. So this is part of the secure language. So if you design a small website, you probably you didn't use something like this. You only create tables, you, um, you select to retrieve information, you use insert update to change information, uh, but those Commands. This this grant command is to to create a hierarchy for the users of the table of the database. Uh, if you want to revoke the privilege of users, you can use a revoke secure command. Revoke revoke certain privilege uh, privileges and also row on which table from a particular user row or public. So those are the access control command built in secure languages. Some examples here are uh, system privilege. Let's say we we have a user Bob. And uh, uh, anyway, there always is a god in the system. That god could be root, could be other names. Uh, that god has the full privilege of the system and uh, the god can run those commands. Uh, let's say we want to, there is a user Bob and uh, we want to, we want to give Bob the permission to create tables. So we can do, uh, create a grant, create table permission to Bob. Uh, if we want to revoke that, just to revoke, create table permission from Bob. Uh, users with grant options, uh, cannot only grant the privilege to others, but also revoke the privilege from any user. So for Bob, uh, we can even uh, give Bob the permission to further grant uh, this permission to other users and also revoke that. Uh, another object privilege example with the same user Bob, we can say grant the select or read permission on table one to Bob. So Bob will be able to do select secure on table one, which is read from table one. And also with grant option means Bob will be able to grant someone else to do this. I revoke uh, the same thing. So because we have this grant concept in secure languages, let's say we have four users, uh, A, B, C, D, 
Uh, a will grant a permission to B first. Uh, B will grant the permission to C. C will grant the permission to D. Um, then usually, uh, many databases is implemented this way. Uh, when a privilege is being revoked, uh, all other privileges that is resulted from uh, get revoked as well. Um, for example, in here, uh, B, uh, if, uh, the, so B granted C the permission P there. But at some point, uh, C grant, grant this permission further to D. Uh, when C's permission to do this is revoked later, uh, D's permission uh, will also be automatically revoked. Uh, or, in another case, if B's permission is out, is revoked, then C and D will also be automatically revoked. So some database implements this kind of a policy. Okay. Uh, however, this is a single, this is a, like a pass, uh, but uh, what if the permissions are very complicated? Uh, there are different uh, passes, um, form a more complicated tree or graph structure for the permissions. Uh, then sometimes it's uh, hard to decide if we want to automatically revoke some permissions. Uh, views. Uh, access control uh, is based on the, so far, all the access control on database, they are based on the columns and the content. Uh, some user, one example, some users can say employees and their department. Uh, but uh, not the salary. So the table we have here is employee. That's the name of the table. Employee ID, name, salary, department. So if we create a new view, which is a subset of the table, then we can create view employee one as select employee ID, name, uh, department ID from the employee. So we create a virtual table, which is a subset of the underlying table, which doesn't have the salary information. Then we can grant the uh, privileges on this virtual table to some users. If we do not want to show those users uh, the salary. To create a view, um, obviously to create a view, the creator uh, must have the permission to uh, have must have the permission on the original uh, tables or at least the columns, uh, all the columns uh, he wants to he or she wants to use. Um, to grant access to the view, uh, the creator must have been granted the corresponding grant privileges or which is a grant option. Uh, to the base tables or the base, the columns of base tables depends on the granularity of the database system. To access the view, the creator must have the proper privilege for the underlying base tables uh, as well. So in database systems, we also have the concept of uh, stored procedures. So procedures are just programs, right? So stored procedures are you can consider them as library functions. So uh, they are just a set of com commands uh, that are compiled into a single uh, function. Uh, they, are library fun well, they are just a library function for database users to call. Um, so we invoke those functions using the call statement in the secure language. Uh, and uh, procedures can also allow for fine-grained access control. Uh, some users, they may be permitted to access the database only by calling procedures. So it's like we don't have a super powerful secure language interface for them to use. They are not allowed to do so. They can only use some predefined procedures, APIs, uh, which has which has a very uh, limited predefined functionality. 
Uh, so this can help us achieve more fine-grained access control. Um, the procedures, there are two rights. Uh, one is called the definer rights or invoker rights. Uh, that's very interesting because this is very similar to uh, in on Linux, we have a set UID program and the regular programs. On Linux, uh, when we run a set UID program, uh, the program executes as the owner's, uh, the, the program's identity is the owner of the program's identity. Uh, so let's say a set, pro, set UID program, its owner is root. Then no matter who runs this program, the effective UID of this program is the root. It's not the whoever is running the program. Uh, then other normal programs, when they run, their effective UID is whoever runs the program. So the stored procedure is uh, similar. The stored procedure is like a program, is like a function. Then there is a, a creator or owner of this stored procedure. Then when other people run this stored procedure, we can either run with the definer or owner's access permission uh, rights or the invoker's rights. So, so the definer right procedures, they are like the Linux set UID programs, but the underlying system is not Linux, but uh, the uh, database. So those kind of procedures, defining right procedures, uh, when they execute, they execute with the definer's rights, which is a owner, a creator of those procedures, right? So a user requires only the privilege to execute the procedure. Uh, the user here is an invoker of that procedure. They only require the privilege to execute the procedure. Uh, they do not need the privilege of the underlying database tables or objects because the owner of that procedure should have those privileges. So in this case, we don't need to grant all the privileges directly to the user. We only need to grant those directly to the owner of the procedure. Does this make sense so far? So some of you may not have the Linux set UID background here. But um, OK, yeah, question. So when you create stored procedure, first of all, it's like the Linux program. Then it will say, who is the owner of this procedure or who created this procedure, right? Then the system will check if the owner has the permission to perform whatever is specified in this procedure. Or, or this can be verified at a runtime. Yeah, either runtime or when you define that. Yeah. Any other questions here? So um, most likely, uh, the owner's privilege are uh, checked at a runtime. Uh, because statistically doing any program analysis would be, uh, would be difficult. Sometimes not uh, always correct. Uh, a user with create procedure privilege. Not every user has a privilege to create a procedure. That's a, that's a different access right, right? Um, so a user with create procedure privilege can effectively share any privileges she has without the grant option. Okay, using create procedure, basically a user can share her permission to everyone in the system because, he, because she can create a stored procedure which can do whatever her permission allows uh, her to do. Then she can share this procedure to everyone in the system. So then everyone get her access, right? Uh, so this is a very powerful tool, especially for um, definer write procedures. Uh, this is very easy to understand. Well, sounds uh, complicated, but very easy to understand if you, you have a Linux background. Let's say 
you are you are the root, uh, you can create a set UID program. Your set UID program can do anything on this system. Uh, then you create a super powerful set UID program. Then you just uh, open this up to everyone in the system. So basically, everyone can be a root, right? So this is the same concept, the same logic here. Then for other procedures, uh, they are kind of like normal Linux programs. Uh, we call them invoker write procedures. Uh, so basically, who that is a stored procedure. Uh, when this procedure is executed, uh, we are not checking who created those procedure. We do not check their permission. We in instead we check the uh, user who calls the procedure, check uh, their permissions. So this is um, very much like uh, any function call uh, using using all the tools in the Linux. Uh, you do a uh, LS uh, in your file system. Uh, you can say the files you can say. Uh, if you do not have the permission to visit uh, a folder, then you will not say anything. So it's based on, it's, it doesn't really matter uh, the owner of uh, LS there. What matters is who is calling LS. So this obviously is a more secure way to provide procedures. Um, because we do not give them the permissions they don't need. Uh, rollback access control or RBAC uh, naturally feeds a database access control. Uh, the use of roles allows for management of privileges for uh, user groups or let's say permission groups. So the database uh, admin can create a role for a group of users with uh, Common privilege requirement can also grant required privilege to a row and grant, uh, grant the row to appropriate uh, users. Um, also, this is a management of privileges for uh, applications or application rows uh, because the database users here, like, like the operating system, uh, eventually we're talking about humans, but there are many programs, applications, they, they execute on behalf of users and they inherit the privilege rights of the uh, users. Uh, so the admin can create a row or several rows for applications, grant necessary privileges to run the application, uh, then grant the application rows to different uh, users. So in rollback model, which we discussed last Friday, uh, we have uh, this user row assignment. Uh, a user may have different rows, many rows, and uh, a row can have uh, several uh, users. Uh, in the SQL languages, uh, we have uh, we have uh, commands to support those operations. To grant a row to a user, we just say we just use grant row. Let's say Bob is a clerk in our organization. We just uh, grant grant row clerk to Bob. To revoke that, we just uh, use revoke. A very similar interface as the permission ones. Uh, the, then we have the row permission assignment, uh, which is another very important module in rollback. Um, let's say the permission here is uh, we want to grant the permission of uh, insert on table one to the row of clerk. Then we just do grant insert on table one to clerk. Okay. So I, I hope uh, when you say this one, you can, you can first say, uh, this is the, the syntax is similar to whatever other secure syntax you have been using. Uh, and also by looking at this, you can uh, think about the RBAC access control model. Uh, there is a row here. Uh, there is a permission here. We are actually assigning a permission to a row instead of assigning a permission directly to a user. Uh, obviously, you can also do that, but when you do that, it's not RBAC. So the database we are using right now, they already 
support our back uh, in some sense. Um, another very interesting thing is so far, all the access control we have uh, discussed, we are talking about the roles of the database. We're not really talking about, we're talking about the columns of the database, sorry. We're talking about if someone, a user, has the right to access a column, an attribute. If they can access a column, it means they can access uh, every record, um, that, that column of every record in the database, right? We didn't really talk about um, ac the, the access control of different rows of each individual um, record. So that's why another com concept called the row-based access control not row-based, row-based access control. Uh, this one is interested in uh, how do we give more fine-grained access control to different records, uh, not only the columns, but also the rows. Um, uh, Oracle actually has something called the, the virtual private database. Uh, this, this mechanism uh, allows for fine-grained row-based access control. Um, let's say we have a database and the database has a table of uh, uh, everyone's deposit information, uh, how much money they have in the bank. So when you design a database, a table like this, you probably will have uh, uh, several columns. The first one will be the user ID, uh, second could be username, the third one could be uh, balance, right? Uh, a very simple table like that. Then assume all the, everyone in this table, they also have a count in the database. They can also query the database. Then what kind of permission we should give them? Uh, we, the permission we want to give them is they should only say their own bank account. They should only have the permission to check their own row in this case. So previous secure languages cannot specify this, right? Then in the Oracle database, this can be protected in this pr virtual private database mechanism or policy. Um, so how this is implemented, um, basically the administrator of the database, they will implement some policy functions. Uh, the policy function is the, the first, they are stored as, um, uh, stored kind of like the stored procedures, uh, but they are created by the root user of the database. So whenever someone makes a query, uh, that query will be changed by the policy function. Uh, let's say a user of that from the table, uh, do a sec query language, select uh, username balance from table uh, one. This secure language will go to the virtual private data database policy function. And that function will add a where statement, where clause to this secure language. It will add well, where where uh, user equals to the current user who is whoever is issuing this command. So it's kind of like adding a firewall there. It's also if you do software security, this is also like instrumentation. Uh, no matter what code you give me, I will instrument more code there to change the code. So the code has been uh, is uh, uh, will, will be confined to its own domain. Then the modified query is executed instead of the original query. So this is how the Oracle VPD uh, works at a very high level. Does this make sense? Okay. 
So the key here is we are adding a where clause to to uh, limit the user's uh, permission to certain row instead of uh, just the columns. Uh, I oh, actually I have a example here. I forgot that. Let's say uh, yeah, let's go over this one. So so we have um. Uh, employee table with uh, attribute of uh, employee ID, name, and the salary. Then Alice can create a policy that an employee can only access all names, but only their own salary. So when Bob queries this table, uh, his identity will be retrieved from the session. So the database system knows now Bob makes a query. Uh, if Bob Queries salary from the table, uh, select name and uh, salary from the table employee. Uh, then the database system, the policy function will add where name equals to Bob to the query. Uh, then the modified query secure will send to the database system for to, for the results, uh, instead of the original in original command created by Bob. This is how uh, the instrumentation uh, makes sure that Bob can only access his own data. So that's uh, all about the uh, security or access control model of uh, database systems. Um, so for the last 20 years, uh, one of the hot topic in database system or even different data sets um, is how can we anonymize those data sets. Uh, people find out that uh, even if we do not give users the direct access to those data base or data sets, uh, we only give them partial permissions to read those data, uh, they can steer infer more sensitive information uh, from the data they can uh, access uh, without breaking any rules. They, they are not really uh, attack the database system at the software security level or doing secure injection. They are just using the data they get. Uh, they can infer other sensitive data uh, in the uh, for some users uh, in the data set. So this is called the inference uh, attack. Uh, obviously, this violates some privacy policies. The inference channel uh, refers to obtaining access to unauthorized data by making inferences about the authorized data. So a combination of data may be more sensitive than individual uh, items. Uh, inferences happens in a single data set, uh, a single database, and also could happen by combining data from uh, different public resources, different databases. Uh, here we have an uh, example. Uh, we have an employee table for a company. Uh, this is a four column table we just saw. We have employee ID, name, salary, and department ID. Uh, they, there is a policy saying that the name and the salary cannot be queried together because we do not want to disclose everyone's salary information. Um, so one way to do this is approach we just talked about. We just uh, use views, right? Uh, we can create two views. Uh, one view is the employee ID and the name. Another view is salary and department ID. So a user of the database who doesn't directly have access to the table can access those two views. So then if we do not randomize the output of the views, then that user can get the first half of the table like this, then the second half of the table like this. Even though this is authorized, the, even though we're not directly telling them, 
uh, Alice Salary 75, but this is not randomized of the order. So obviously, you can, inf you can, as a user of the database, you can easily tell uh, everyone's salary. Okay, didn't do any attack. So one simple approach here, maybe we just uh, randomize those two tables, so they cannot be directly linked together. Uh, however, uh, here we are not even talking about the data. Let's say even if we randomize the order there, those those this table, um, this table here. Uh, we randomize it, the second table, randomize the order. But we, we already know that, uh, or even we get rid of the first table. We don't have, we don't even have the first table. We only have the second table, right? Even we, we only have the second table. We know that, uh, from other channels, we know that maybe, a uh, department one, uh, there is only one guy, which is Kyle. Then department, Two, there is only one guy, which is Bob. So if even from this uh, partial table, we can still infer Carl and Bob's salary, disclose their private sensitive information. Right? So this is uh, more complicated uh, than just uh, randomly reorder those uh, records. So uh, to uh, detect if we leak such information uh, is uh, very difficult, uh, even without assuming some outside information. For example, like we know Carl is from department one, Bob is from department two. Uh, the process uh, is very dependent on the specifics of the database and the policy, uh, which data items are sensitive, what are the secure policies, uh, what functionality is, is desired. Um, there has been many discussions in the privacy community, uh, the data management group, uh, community, the database community, uh, to how to reduce the possibility of uh, inf inference, how to uh, preserve the privacy of uh, uh, users. So we can uh, split this data into multiple tables, uh, also employ more fine-grained access control rules uh, or procedures. Uh, let's say, uh, that's why uh, one of the database uh, have been in discussion is called the statistical database. Uh, they allow users to obtain aggregate information of uh, statistic nature, but cannot get particular uh, rows or records uh, in the database. This can be achieved by the database already have those statistical data, uh, or the database contains <coughs> information about uh, individual data items, but the database do not give those information out. Instead, the database will only answer queries of um, aggregate nature, such as uh, it will answer in this range, what is the count uh, of uh, records, uh, what is the sum of the records, what is the average of records, uh, maximum or minimum of records, uh, those. But even those operations, uh, may be used together to leak uh, some individual's uh, information. It's still possible. Uh, but the goal is to prevent the user of database from inferring information about uh, some individuals. Um, so if queries are unrestricted in a statistical database, uh, compromising it may be easy. Uh, if the database size is not big, uh, certain queries may have, uh, let's say, the count of uh, the condition is only one. Uh, then, uh, that, then we can, if the condition, the, the count of the condition is one, then we just query the sum of the condition because it's only one item, right? Then we actually get that actual, actual value. 
Uh, for example, uh, the, the, if we can, we have a select salary where department number is two. Uh, the, we cannot directly execute this secure language. We can only execute the sum of a secure language. But we already know that department two only has Bob. Only Bob is there. So the sum here doesn't, um, obfuscate Bob's salary anyhow, right? So by doing this, we can still uh, get Bob's salary. Uh, with larger database, more data, um, this may be a little bit more complicated, but a combination of queries may also compromise individual uh, entries. Uh, many proposed solutions, uh, for example, query restriction. Uh, we, if we can identify some queries may need to compromise, we uh, reject those queries. And also, uh, perturbations. We answer the queries, but we modify the data. So now it's not about the integrity of the data anymore. <laughs> the database do not necessarily always give you uh, the correct or accurate answer uh, because the database goal is to protect the privacy of users, uh, not trying to maintain the, pri the integrity of the data. Uh, could, um, for example, the database can reject all queries that covering fewer than K records. When you ask something, uh, what, it, what is calculated there must be more than a threshold. Uh, you ask uh, the sum of some department salary. If that department only has one people or five people, nine people, we reject. We only give you that answer if the department has more than 10 people. The threshold there is 10. Uh, can specify to reject all query covering more than uh, N minus K. Uh, so, um, let's say the department has 11 people and, uh, you do two queries. I query the sum of all 11 people. Then you do a query of sum of uh, 10 people. Then you still get the salary of the next one by directly minus those two values, right? Uh, subtract those values from another one. So that's why uh, another policy is to reject queries covering uh, more than n minus k records. Um, uh, or you can only give the statistics on the entire database, uh, entire uh, row. Uh, still, uh, compromise could happen. Uh, very, uh, there are just too many ways to, to design clever approaches to reveal information here. Uh, query, Set uh, overlap control is a ladder approach. Uh, mandates that the overlap between the current and all past queries is at most a uh, threshold. Uh, information on both a set and uh, its subset will not be released. The, pro the example I give you, query 11 people or query 10 people. So then it's a set, a full set and a subset. That should be not be released. Uh, his history-based access controls and require a log logging of all previous queries. Uh, of course, those approaches are still not perfect. Uh, also, partition. We can partition data into groups and only query that only querying the whole groups uh, is a lot. Um, uh, however, I mean, an interesting finding is. Uh, if you send a query and the query is denied, uh, even that is leaking some information, right? Um, other type of data perturbation include uh, data swapping. Uh, obviously, integrity is not important anymore, like I said. Uh, we are giving the users some wrong information regarding the data um, to protect the user privacy. We can also add the noise there. Uh, in the database, uh, Bob's salary was 60. Uh, when you do a query, 
we uh, get a random number and add to that. It could be, uh, depends on the range of a random number. Uh, this could be um, much different. It could be 80, it could be 40 to protect the user privacy. Uh, also, we can replace data with an estimation. Uh, however, this is a trade-off between accuracy, integrity of the data, and the privacy. So uh, how to really do that uh, is um, it's uh, really a very difficult trade-off. Also, there are uh, two more approaches which have been uh, very um the first one, K alumni, was proposed maybe 15 years ago, I believe, by, by a professor from Purdue, I believe. Um, so K alumni here means at least whatever you return, at least uh, K records contains uh, identical uh, quasi identifiers. So they are very similar. They are at least the K records very similar. So it's hard for the user to tell uh, which record belongs to which uh, individual. Uh, another one is called uh, differential privacy. This is this is a still a very hot research area. Uh, there are a lot of uh, math behind this. Um, also, many uh, systems behind this uh, differential privacy. Um, so besides those privacy issues, uh, some other new trends in database security, uh, including uh, outsourced database, uh, third party publishing, data owners creates and maintains the database, uh, service providers store the database and answers queries on behalf of the data owner, uh, users direct their queries to the service provider. So we have another <coughs> layer of service here, uh, which brings more security challenges. Um, some unique security challenges when the service provider is not completely uh, trusted. Uh, Uh, users want to prove that the query answers are complete, uh, data haven't been deleted, or users want to prove that query answers are uh, authentic. Authentic, uh, extra data has not been added. Uh, so the service provider here, uh, they are third party, they are not necessarily trusted, so how we do, do that? So some of that uh, requires a lot of help from uh, system security, uh, so in software security class, we we'll probably mentioned a little bit about trusted execution environment. So how many of you here heard about uh, Intel SGX or ARM Trust Zone? No? So those are new CPU features in the last decade. Um, SGX is probably five or six years old and has been quite successful in uh, servers. And the idea is you can run. So the idea is you are going to use some cloud service. Uh, you do not have physical access to your, well, you, you have the physical access to your machine, but your cloud provider like Amazon also have the physical access to the machine. Uh, then how can you make sure that the program running on that physical, uh, that, that a cloud server you can trust. Uh, how can you um, make sure that the cloud server is not, uh, let's say, changing data here, changing execution here. That's why the CPU has a new module called Trusted Execution Environment. And uh, with that, you do not have to trust your cloud provider. You only need to trust the CPU, which is manufactured by Intel. So you, you only trust Intel provides this secure feature and uh, the Intel has, um, uh, you, so you have an isolated execution environment to run your program, uh, even though that environment is hosted by Amazon. Um, so those are the solutions to try to address 
uh, these kind of issues, the untrusted third party. Well, of course, by solving this problem, we are still introducing another trusted third party, which is Intel. But the argument is it is easier to trust the hardware manufacturers, but very difficult to trust the uh, software providers or whoever provided you with the machine. No, not the manufacturer. Uh, also, we can uh, inc encrypt part or the entire uh, database or put the whole thing into the trusted execution environment. So they are not necessarily encrypted at runtime, but no one can access that. Uh, but uh, uh, working with encrypted database, obviously it's a challenging task um, because everything there is uh, ciphertext. They do not have the plain text data. How do you search over those data. Uh, it's also a very hot topic. Uh, I see many people talking about how to search uh, encrypted data. Uh, I'm not an expert in that domain, uh, but if you are interested, just uh, just Google uh, search over encrypted data in Google Scholar. You'll find many papers uh, talking about that. Uh, okay, so today we talked about database security uh, covering access control, uh, inference attacks, and such several new topics. So after this class, uh, we finished uh, most of the data security part. So um, after you come back from spring break, we've been talking about system, system security topics, uh, which I directly work on, including software security, uh, network security, uh, operating system security, uh, those topics. Um, uh, we were, uh, you will use uh, my system to do some uh, experiments and uh, homework. Uh, any questions regarding the database part or other data security topics? So the midterm format where there will be uh, short answer questions, there will be uh, multiple choice uh, questions and also true or false. Yeah, just those questions. S well, um, slides, homework, and also the books, chapters I ask you guys to read. Yeah, so... Um, the book I ask you guys to read is a, is a very easy to read book. Okay. We, we didn't choose the computer security art and science. That is a totally different book to read, but uh, the book I give you guys should be easy to read. So you should assume any, anything there as long as I mention the chapter could be, could be there. But, uh, all the courses I'm teaching, I'm not trying to just to force you to remember the concept for those guys took my software security course. You know, my software security class is totally open book. You have the internet in the exams. The exams are just a CTF. You, uh, every, every exam I design new CTF challenges. So you cannot find online. Um, so you, you have internet, you have everything, but that's before chat GPT. Chat GPT is, is, is changing things. So technically now, if, if you have the source code of my challenge, the software security challenge, the say, say source code, you gave that to ChatGPT. ChatGPT can tell you, hey, this is a buffer overflow. You can explore it that way. So I, I don't know how to respond to that yet. Uh, but for this course, it's fully closed the book, but it's still not about just remembering those concepts. Okay. For most of the questions, if I ask you something, I probably will explain to you, hey, this is a concept. And this is a scenario and tell me how do you apply this concept or something like that. I, I, I do not really care that you just uh, only remembering those concepts. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Mm hmm Um, uh, we can talk offline, I guess. 
Okay, so everyone else, uh, see you guys Wednesday. Uh, bring your ID. I give you guys the rules, okay? Follow the rules. Uh, see you Wednesday.